Welcome to Headline Buster brought to you by The Point. I'm Lee Cho Yuan sitting in for Liu Xin. In this series, I dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my guests to make up for the missing pieces, some deliberately of the puzzle, to join us in real time by sending us your comments or questions via the CGTN page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Weibo, or WeChat. We live stream Headline Buster at 11 a.m. Beijing time on Thursdays and air the segment on TV at 11.30 a.m. on Fridays. Do join us during the live streaming and get in touch. We would love to receive and possibly read out your insightful comments. Now, we've all heard that all is fair in love, in love and war, and Washington has too often up the ante at his own perils. But when you play with fire, you get burned. America's star has been waning in the last decade or so, and the country is now increasingly on the defensive. It's also becoming paranoid as China makes huge strides in Latin America with increased trade and investment. In a typical case of nimbyism, that is to say, not in my backyard, the U.S. still tries every trick in the book to denigrate China's achievements south of the border. And at the same time, the Biden administration is now having its own road to the musket moment with Secretary of State Antony Blinken's trip to Beijing on June 18th in an attempt to mend fences. So, the United States is clearly on the defensive, but is it blowing hot and cold and biding its time? Well, let's look at the recent geopolitical events. Hard on the heels of China's successful attempts to bring peace and stability in the Middle East, there has been a string of state visits from Latin American leaders. The Honduran president, Xiomara Castro, ended her historic trip to China on June 14th. It came after Brazilian president Lula da Silva wrapped up his fourth visit to China in April. Now, these are highly symbolic achievements. Why? Well, let's first take a look at Honduras. China and Honduras established diplomatic relations at the ambassadorial level in March, right after Honduras decided to sever diplomatic relations with the Taiwan authorities. With Xiomara Castro's visit, both countries signed 17 bilateral cooperation documents in areas ranging from the Belt and Road Initiative, infrastructure projects, economy and trade, technology, education, and other areas. President Castro also submitted a formal application to join the BRICS-led New Development Bank. Honduras said it firmly supports and abides by the One China Principle and firmly backs China's efforts to realize national reunification. And now let's take a look at Brazil. Well, the new Lula administration has put the China-Brazil relations back on the right track after the anti-China rhetoric of its predecessor, Jair Bolsonaro. President Lula put South-South cooperation high on the agenda in a bid to become part of an anti-hegemonic force that pushes toward a multipolar international order. Meanwhile, the U.S. seems to be at the end of its rope, with China's growing sway in Latin America and having to deal with the negative impact of the, its China policy. Washington now wants, surprise, surprise, to get its relations with China back on track. Well, on June 18th, the United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in Beijing for talks on managing tensions in the highest level U.S. visit since President Joe Biden took office. And during the meeting, Chinese President Xi Jinping urged actions to stabilize and improve China-U.S. relations and emphasized that whether the two countries can find the right way to get along bears on the future and destiny of humanity. So... How do the Western media analyze the seemingly reshuffling of the geopolitical deck? Is the U.S. back with a vengeance to win hearts and minds after a slew of bad news? An obscure paper published in December 2021 in CPOL, an academic reveal that looks at Latin America's economies drew my attention. It's got Latin America and China, mutual benefit or dependency. The article concludes that well-being in Latin America has increased mainly owing to improvements in the terms of trade. And that's definitely a mutual benefit, isn't it? So how come headlines such as China's dollar diplomacy or allegations of China's tightening up its grip on lack countries still prevail in the West and its allies? CNN ran an article and cast doubt on China's real motives. Lots of finger pointing here. It says Beijing is using China's huge market as both a carrot and a stick to peel away the remaining countries in an approach many experts label as, quote, dollar diplomacy. And as a quick reminder, the dollar diplomacy was a controversial U.S. policy in the 1900s aimed at putting pressure on foreign governments that U.S. officials and investors consider unstable. You know, like in The Godfather, I'm going to make you an offer you can refuse. Such practice has continued in ever-changing forms throughout the 20th century. And now, 
Is China engaged in such dollar diplomacy? Well, Honduras is a sovereign country, and it puts its money where its mouth is. Cooperation and development obviously take precedence over flimsy political considerations and financial pressure. President Ziomara Castro perfectly understands this rationale. And now even much scarier is the alleged China's tightening of its grip on Honduras and other Latin American countries, as seen in the Times. Well, China's growing influence is seen as increasing assertiveness and a factor of polarization, it says. Basically, countries have to take size. And NPR echoes that mindset. The diplomatic victory for China comes as tensions rise between Beijing and the United States, including over China's increasing assertiveness towards self-rule Taiwan and signals growing Chinese influence in Latin America. In the article, a political analyst is quoted as saying that Beijing's narrative would highlight the benefits, including investment and job creation, but that is all going to be illusory. Illusory? Well, China and Honduras have already witnessed a year-on-year -year trade increase of 22.9% in the first four months of 2023. And China's colossal market has begun to step up its consumption of trademark Honduran produce since March. And as a sign of building on that rapid progress, President Xi Jinping committed China's firm support to Honduran economic and social development and caught on both sides to prioritize efforts that lift people's livelihoods. So truth is, that's nimbyism for you. Well, Washington's feathers have been ruffled as more countries in Central America, in South America, and in the Caribbean turn to China for development and cooperation. But what does Beijing want? Well, the economist already has this answer, and it's not about fostering development and deepening cooperation. The simple answer could be, it's geopolitical, stupid. Well, China seems to be winning the geopolitical popularity contest, the article says, concluding that whether China's deeper engagement is a risk depends on the eye of the beholder, according to a Mexican official. So infrastructure projects, cooperation, and bilateral partnerships in the region have provided China with a footing that could be used for commercial espionage or even military purposes, such as deep water ports, telecommunication systems, surveillance technology, and space observatories, according to foreign policy. But the Western media failed to acknowledge that China has filled a void left by Washington's lack of interest in the region that it nevertheless considers as its backyard, a region that has suffered from Washington's heavy-handed approach in the last hundreds of years, if not more. And in many countries, memories of unrest and hardship are still vivid. In some cases, ordinary people continue to pay the price for Washington's erratic foreign policy, or I should say lack of it. Ask people in Central America, in Cuba, in Venezuela, in Argentina, and in Chile. Now it's interesting to observe that in such troubled times, the United States is eager to bury the hatchet with China. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in Beijing last Sunday and met with Chinese President Xi Jinping. Can we expect Washington to eat humble pie and take the road to Damascus? Well, that's what it looks like anyway. The China-U.S. relations have record low recently, and the fence mending starts with little progress, one step at a time. And that's what Antony Blinken said in his tweet. Through open channels of communication, well, it's not going to be all roses. But there are still media that would rather see the optimistic side, such as this editorial piece from Washington Post titled, Blinken is traveling a long way to talk with China. Good. Well, Blinken's trip might not be enough, it says, but, and I quote, it's essential to renew dialogue, especially military to military talks. Keeping channels of communication open is essential among adversaries and competitors. A high-level visit, the kind that used to be routine, is a good place to start. Well, even as even U.S. President Biden told reporters, we are on the right trail here, adding that Blinken had made progress on its two-day trip, which concluded on Monday. China has been keen on telling the world that the Chinese market is more than ever open for business. The corporate world in the U.S. heard the message loud and clear. Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates, meeting with President Xi in a couple of weeks ago, followed visits to Beijing by J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon, Starbucks CEO Laxman Narasian, and Tesla and Twitter CEO Elon Musk. All the talk about decoupling and de-risking in the West might just be sheer rhetoric aimed at domestic audiences. The U.S has probably realized that it may well be hoisted by its own petard and suffer the consequences of its adversarial approach to foreign affairs, which has been at times plainly antagonistic. So, 
Will Washington's road to Damascus herald a more conciliatory approach to solving disputes? Can the U.S. share its Latin American backyard with China in a way conducive to stability and development? Or is the U.S. blowing hot and cold and just biding its time? Well, don't go away. We'll ask our guests after this short break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Headline Buster. We want to get more perspectives on the China-U.S. relations after a series of high-stake visits. And we're now joined by an awesome panel. Let me introduce them to you. We're joined by Mr. Yang Xiyue, political analyst, joining me in Beijing online. And Mr. Rafael Enrique Zerbeto, Brazilian Esperanto expert, the Center for Asia Pacific, joining us also here in Beijing via Skype. And last but not least, Mr. James Heimowitz, honorary chair of the China Institute in America. He is joining us from New York. Great to see all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. So let's talk about this. Let's start with the latest development. I mean, the Honduras president has just visited China not too long after the Brazilian president's trip to Beijing. And a lot of people have brought up the Monroe Doctrine once again, which has been a long-standing tenet of the U.S. foreign policy in the rest of Americas. And now China is seeing as gnawing away at Washington's dominant influence in that region, and Washington is not happy about it. Uh, Mr. Zerbato, let me start with you. What do you think? I, uh, well, uh, it's clear for me that uh, President Lula wants a closer uh, ties with uh, China, but it doesn't mean that we are opposing the U.S. Just uh, Brazil has a tradition of no alignment. We understand that for Brazil, it's better uh, to have good relations with different countries and try to take benefits from the cooperation with those different countries. We are not looking for a Cold War in Latin America or something like that. So when Lula comes to China, that's his signal that uh, he knows that uh, China's economy is growing, China is bringing opportunities for other countries around the world. And also Brazil wants to take the benefits of the development of China you know, Chinese companies are investing a lot in Brazil. Uh, Bra uh, Brazilian exports are also the biggest portion goes to China. So it's normal. China is the biggest uh, commercial partner of Brazil. We must have good relations. But uh, yes, the United States tend to see this uh, as um, a threat uh, because they traditionally see Latin America as its backyard. So uh, this tension must be solved in some way. But Brazil, as, as uh, an independent country, must pursue its own interests rather than the interests of another country. Uh, Mr. Hamowitz, let me bring you into this. Your reaction to what's been said there, your thoughts on the Monroe Doctrine, is that still relevant? Well, you know, first, thank you so much for including me here. I think it's so important for people around the world, particularly in China, um, to to be closer to be more closely connected with what people are thinking and feeling in in the U.S. and I think what's coming out here is that no matter whether America likes it or not, China is emerging as a global leader, and the world, and particularly America, is is taking this really thinking hard about this and saying, what kind of a leader is China becoming? How will its leadership style, um, you know, take shape? whether it's in Latin America, whether it's in Africa, or whether it's the way the two most important countries, China and the U.S., interact with each other. And I think that's what we're sort of experiencing now, um, is people standing back and watching, watching Americans' behavior, how, how America has behaved over the past few decades, and increasingly the way that China is interacting with its na close neighbors, as well as uh, neighbors or, or countries that are a little bit more far flung, but are deeply connected as Rafael and the others have talked about the connectivity between um, Latin America and China. Yeah. So I think, I think the jury's pretty much out on that. And I think people are sort of watching and trying to understand um, what kind of values are going to emerge. And looking at uh, the Western media coverage of it, uh, Mr. Heimowitz, looking at the Western coverage after Honduras president visiting China, what are your thoughts? Because they are making it look like it's another nail on the co in the coffin of America's global dominance. Well, um, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily characterize it that way. I think what there is, is people looking and saying, hmm, you know, I think that 
America's um, leadership role had certain characteristics um, that were very, very different from the way that China is engaging. And I wouldn't say that it's another a nail in the coffin, um, but I would say that it's cautionary. And I would say that people are watching. Um, if you look recently, you can see that I think both sides are eager to sort of repair um, and move forward. You talked a little bit earlier on about um, Secretary Blinken's visit to Beijing. This is, this is really important. Um, you know, not so much in what was accomplished, but because it's a, a restart. And I think it's important that senior leadership people in the U.S. are actually visiting China. So I think that's a good start. And Rafael, why do you think more and more countries in Latin America and the Caribbean are looking to China and China solutions? What real benefits do they see? Because uh, well, China has uh, the biggest consumer market in the world and this marketing this market is developing very fast uh, and uh, China is growing its imports. Also, Chinese companies are expanding to other countries, are creating jobs, are, crea are investing in infrastructure, in uh, many things that uh, are of the interest of those countries. But nowadays, especially since the 90s, the um, United States have been basically doing um, uh, investments in the sense that uh, you have uh, uh, they are financing things but they are like uh, investing in speculating in Latin American countries and just bringing the money away right and China is now investing in the real economy of those countries so Chinese companies go to Latin America they, they really put money there they buy our production they create jobs and even better jobs. And this is what Latin America is in need right now. So this creates a, a different situation, right? The U.S. basically wants, uh, the, there are like uh, some investors who go to the stock market in Latin America to speculate and make money. But uh, China comes with jobs and with investments that will create benefits for the local people. Hmm. But despite of that, we often hear allegations, uh, Mr. Yang, allegations of dollar diplomacy and debt trap diplomacy when we speak about China building infrastructures, building partnerships with countries in the global south and invest uh, and, and increase their trade there. Um, this narrative is not going away. Well, I think what you all mentioned uh, uh, stem from two reasons. One reason is uh, intentionally demonize China's efforts to develop, develop uh, uh, economic ties with all developing countries. Many of those countries were used to be the Western countries' uh, colonial parts. And now China's influences, China's ties, China's cooperation has uh, uh, increasingly more and more than the ties, the previous colonized uh, uh, relations. So uh, from very, a dark uh, psychology, they intentionally demonize all China's efforts uh, to be bad. And secondly, uh, during the past, many Western countries uh, get loans to uh, developing countries, but with very strict preconditions. I want to point at one uh, key point, say, the difference between Chinese loan and the previous Western countries' loans to developing country lies in the preconditional or non-preconditional. Precondition used by Western countries to dictate, to intervene, to guide uh, the recipients' uh, development, recipients' domestic policies. And uh, without precondition, means all the cooperation partners are equal footing and China uh, as, uh, as a uh, partner pay full respects uh, on the, part, the other partner's uh, uh, sovereignty. So that is the key difference. And uh, based on the uh, non-precondition, all narratives demonize the world are groundless and uh, useless, I think. With time going, 
more and more people, including people from Western world, will recognize more and more clearly that Chinese way to uh, loan to the uh, developing countries are totally different from what the Western country did during the past and now. Mr. Hamowitz, I want to give you a chance to respond here. Help us understand the U.S. perspectives on this. Why are they approaching this matter this way? Well, sure, I, I'd uh, like to give that a try. And I, I fully agree with you that, you know, the United States in, or certain, you know, media voices or, or, or sectors in the United States have indeed demonized many of the things that um, many of China's initiatives you know, I work closely, for example, with Confucius Institutes, and I watched how that had become weaponized. I looked at, you know, what Confucius Institutes did. They tried to help um, foreigners better understand China by helping them, giving them the skills they need um, to communicate in Chinese. Yet, you're very right. This has gotten somehow twisted and warped in the U.S. and has become weaponized. To me, this is emblematic of a very poor state of communications, a very poor state of understanding. And it means we need to double down and reinvest in sort of obliterating that ignorance and getting both sides a little bit more comfortable. There's too much highly charged rhetoric going around. Um, and how do we sort of um, calm that down and raise the level of understanding and awareness? I think we need to go back to the basics and the basics are connecting people. Most Americans have very little insight or understanding of what China looks and feels like today. And that problem has been exacerbated by first COVID and now the tense relationship. So many fewer Americans are visiting China and for that matter, Chinese to the US, but it's particularly pronounced with the drop, precipitous drop of Americans, whether it's students, mm -hmm. businessmen, academics, across every sort of field right. we see a tremendous drop. And so I think that until we move forward and we increase those levels of connectivity and understanding and communication, these kinds of um, misperceptions are only going to become worse. Right. I want to get to Blinken's trip to Beijing. The official, the main message from the readout after his meeting with Qinggang was to keep channels of communication open. Mr. Hyman was help us understand what does that mean in plain language? Well, what it means in, in plain language first, I would really like to set it and say, you know, I think that the government isn't actually taking the lead here. In my view, government lags behind. And that's kind of good that it's not a leading indicator. And that means that there are forces um, in the U.S., business community, academic community, other places that would very much like to see a healthier, more robust um dialogue and interaction and relationship. So I guess the way to look at this, and I think it was very meaningful that we sent somebody as senior as Secretary Blinken to go, and I think it was equally meaningful and tremendously helpful that um, President Xi met with him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is what a, a mature relationship is about. It doesn't always mean that it's easy. It doesn't always mean that, you know, there's no friction or problems, but what it means is both sides feel a level of comfort where they can share those concerns and anxieties and begin to address them and chip away at what the concerns are and slowly make an, you know, advances. Because as I said earlier in this discussion, clearly um, this is the planet's most consequential relationship and it's mm -hmm. too important for us just to watch it spiral down. Oh, definitely. But just days after the Beijing talks, Mr. Yang, President Biden referred to President Xi as a dictator when he was talking about the balloon incident in February. What is happening there? Well, I think uh, uh, from the balloon incident to the latest remarks by Biden really reflects uh, uh, a U.S. Uh, policy towards China based on the so-called uh, two-hand tactics. We Chinese call it as a liangshou cetera. That means uh, on one hand, uh, U.S. always try all efforts to contain China, put uh, all pressures in maximum matters, um, manners. But on the other hand, they do concern about uh, the out of control by China's uh, counteroffensive. Chinese, uh, uh, they they concern China's uh, potential counteroffensive uh, 
against their maximum uh, pressure or containment uh, measures. Therefore, uh, the other hand, they, they try to set up this cause, the so-called handrail through dialogues. So that is the purpose. The second, uh, second hand of the uh, consideration is the purpose of Blinken's visit. Say, they keep doing maximum pressure on China, but meanwhile, they try every effort to set up the so-called handrail to prevent the relation between the two big powers from out of control. So that is their mindset, that, are their, that is their uh, tactics. That is why Chinese has a very deep distrust against the US. We welcome dialogues with the American partners. However, we insist we should not conduct talks for talks. We need to have a talks for results. And uh, unfortunately, for American part, based on their the so-called two-hand tactics, they keep doing maximum pressure on China, uh, provocative for China's dignity, but on the other hand, try to calm down uh, China, not go to the offensive, uh, uh, offense, uh, counter-offensive uh, measure. That is uh, the difficulties and the obstacles for the very meaningful dialogues between the two countries that impede uh, the two countries from getting achievements just because they were their uh, two-hand tactics. Mr. Hamowitz, I want to get your thoughts on this. I mean, with the 2024 elections coming, the Biden administration is obviously facing tremendous pressure both at home and abroad. Which way could he go? Could he go even tougher? Will we hear a much more anti-China rhetoric or would we see his administration striking for a more conciliatory tone? That's a, a, a really, really interesting question. And, um, you know, the two systems are so different in the United States and in China. And Joe Biden has to answer to the voters in a very different kind of a way um, than, than operates in China. So what you've asked, and really we need to keep a careful watch because what it speaks to is really the state is emblematic of the state of relations between China and the U.S. And I personally hope that we will see a bit more brain and a little bit less heart um, coming into the situation. I believe that what we've just witnessed is a really good start. And I think what we need more of is um, dialogue, engagement, addressing these kinds of issues and um, concerns at all levels, um, both at the at the you know, at the business level, as we've talked about, um, all the different sectors, not just government. Because, as I said, I think government is emblematic of the state of relationship, not really driving it. All right. I'm afraid this is all the time we have for now. This is such an important topic. Uh, you know, the disagreements between the two here could have serious implications for global security and stability. That is why it is so important to keep communications lines open to avoid misunderstanding. Thank you so much for contributing all your insights and perspectives. Always oh, great to have you with us on the show. And that's going to do it for our headline buster here on CDTN. Thank you so much for your company. Bye for now.